Sheldon Krantz is a distinguished visiting professor of law at the University of Maryland Carey School of Law. He has served as dean of the University of San Diego Law School and as a law professor at the Boston University Law School. For two decades, he was a litigation partner at DLA Piper, one of the world's largest law firms. He has also served as a federal prosecutor and a Massachusetts Criminal Justice Agency director and a lot of other things too, but this is as much as I could fit on this piece of paper. <laughs> His distinguished legal career and the variety of positions he's held qualify him as an expert on that subject he is here to talk about today and the title of the book, The Legal Profession, What is Wrong and How to Fix It. Thanks for coming and please help me welcome Sheldon Krantz. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Uh, it's a special treat for me to be able to come to politics and prose. Uh, it's a, a bookstore that has such an important history in this city, and I think everybody who's here wants it to survive forever. Uh, there are a lot of good friends here, and I'm delighted uh, to see you all. But I'm also uh, convinced that I'm looking at uh, some of you, I'm going to get very tough questions. Uh, at the end of the presentation, actually, I welcome them. Uh, a book about the legal profession and what's wrong with it has a special significance in Washington. Uh, I want to start out, does anybody know how many lawyers there are in Washington? <laughs> Too many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, take a guess. What, what, what would you say? 50,000? 15,000. Ninety. Well, actually, ninety is is closer. The Washingtonian Magazine a couple of years ago uh, tried to do a systematic survey of the number of lawyers in Washington, not even going into the metropolitan area. And after checking D.C. bar statistics and also statistics on how many people work in the federal government who are lawyers, uh, the number they came up with is eighty thousand lawyers. Uh, in Washington, uh, when you think about that and compare it to the population of the city, which is not more than about 600,000 or so, uh, that's a pretty dramatic number. And I'm going to come back uh, to the significance of this number, 80,000, a little bit later in my presentation. Uh, now, why did I decide to write a book about the legal profession? Uh, I was drawn to the profession like so many of you who are lawyers because of the role that we have played uh, over time in creating and shaping our nation. Uh, I also thought that lawyers had a unique ability uh, to pursue equal justice and fairness, and the amount of money that a client could pay was supposed to be irrelevant. Uh, but what is the situation today? What really did cause me to write this book? First of all, it's apparent uh, that the practice of law, particularly in bigger firms, uh, is conducted today more as a self-promoting business than as a helping profession. In addition, uh, I note some of the following concerns uh, in the book. Uh, let me just read very briefly from some of them. First of all, Many lawyers, unfortunately, hate what they do. Uh, it's not surprising that current and prospective lawyers are unsettled. Many who are employed simply don't like the jobs that are assigned to them. One of the statistics I found is that up to 40% of people who were interviewed indicated that they wanted to leave the field altogether. About a third change jobs every three years. And a substantial number of people have said they would not recommend the legal profession to others, to their kids, uh, to others who are thinking about what they want to do. Now, it's not unusual for people to complain about what they do, but there seems to be something more at play here. Like me, lawyers in growing numbers are questioning the value or worth of the services they provide and to whom they are providing. Many more find limited gratification in simply protecting the interests of the wealthy. The second point that I identify in uh, the early part of the book is 
that there are more than a million lawyers in America, but most people with legal problems don't have the means to hire one. It is ironic that at a time when lawyers are feeling that something is missing in their lives, there is also an access to justice crisis <coughs> of unprecedented proportion in this country. According to one survey, more than 64 million people with civil legal problems fall within that category. And this number does not include people who have some means, but not enough to pay the hourly rates that most lawyers charge. <coughs> the legal profession has utterly failed to address this problem. The third point I make early on, the legal profession retains a virtual monopoly over providing advice and counsel on legal matters and has resisted strongly allowing others to step in and help. As a result, most people facing eviction or loss of benefits or loss of child custody among legal pro other legal problems must navigate the confusing legal system on their own without the help of a lawyer and without the ability to turn to anyone else for assistance. So those are some of the early introductory comments I make. And with respect to access to justice, because we're in Washington, D.C., let me also read very briefly from a report that was done by the D.C. Access to Justice Commission. And Peter Edelman I saw here, I see here, uh, who is the chair, the distinguished chair of that commission. Uh, and before I had the honor of serving on the board, the commission did a report. And here's what it says in very, I think, strong terms. Somewhere in the district, a family won't have enough to eat tonight because of a bureaucratic mistake. A child will be hospitalized yet again because the rat droppings in her apartment caused an asthma attack. A veteran who has served in combat will sleep on the street because he could not access the public benefits, mental health services, and shelter to which he is entitled. Because of the crisis in legal services, there are simply not enough lawyers to help our suffering, low-income neighbors. And next year, there will be even fewer. And sorry to say, the problem is getting even worse. There's been, and I think many of you are aware of this, consistent slashing in funding for legal services programs. Uh, one of the figures I cite is that Legal Services Corporation in fiscal year 2010 had a budget of $420 million. That has decreased to $348 million in fiscal 2013. And it's not over yet. And this is coming at a time, and Peter Edelman can certainly talk to this more than I can, that poverty levels are increasing. And the crisis does not only apply to the impoverished. And this is one of the things that really persuaded me to sit down and write this book. Those with modest incomes, so we're not only talking about the poor, blue collar workers, retired pensioners, small business owners, nonprofits, among others, have nowhere to go when they have legal problems. Uh, it is striking that we have developed the mentality, uh, and some of it relates to uh, what the publication the American Lawyer has focused on, profits per partner, that you measure success by the hourly rate you charge or what your total income is, and the striking thing is who that leaves behind. So let me return to Washington a moment. Uh, what I said about the 80,000 lawyers, and the overwhelming number of people here with unmet legal services problems. 
if you in effect took the aspirational number that the american bar association has set for lawyers which is every lawyer supposed to perform fifty hours of pro bono service every year if you took that number and multiplied it by the eighty thousand lawyers who were in washington there would be four million hours of pro bono time that services that are needed and that lawyers in this community could provide four million hours and even though there are a lot of very good lawyers in this community who provide pro bono service when you figure out what the averages are it is clear that we are not getting anywhere close to the commitment of being a helping profession for those who do not have the ability to pay our normal rates so with that background let me point to another comment that came out of the book I say that the legal profession must now admit failure and recognize it will need to deploy comprehensive strategies throughout the country to tackle the access to justice crisis successfully we should consider this crisis because I really do believe that someone struggling with a legal problem is very much akin to someone struggling with a health care problem it requires a societal response people in this country should not be denied legal services where they have liberty at stake where they have uh, access uh, to fair treatment at stake but they are and so what I say is the failure to provide legal protection to millions is as serious a domestic problem as the lack of adequate health care or even the failure to respond to a widespread epidemic the core point I make in this book as that we have re now reached a point in our history where we have to refocus and become the helping profession not just for those who can afford to pay the rates we charge and now is the right time to do it and here's why the profession can no longer afford to be complacent there are too many changes occurring in the marketplace uh, as many of you know uh, some of the bigger law firms have failed uh, consumers are starting to raise questions about the value of our services there's new form of competition I think we all see the legal zoom ads which are an indication why do you need a lawyer because we can help you uh, with information we put on our internet uh, there are shifts in the lawyer population uh, one of the statistics I mentioned is that by next year because of the baby boom generation about 500,000 lawyers close to 50 percent of all lawyers in our society are eligible to retire uh, that's a dramatic uh, development and then as I think we all know uh, those of us who grew up practicing law without technology are suddenly recognizing that technology itself is going to be the core of our future uh, it's going to be the way to help uh, clients and we simply are not in a position yet or at least most of the lawyers to understand this now it's not hard uh, I certainly didn't find it hard and I'm sure many of you would not either to define the problem uh, but what I've tried to do in this book is to talk about what we should do about it and let me give you some illustrations of the recommendations I've made and then I welcome uh, your questions uh, because I think it would be fun to uh, pursue a little bit of dialogue about this first of all with respect to the access to justice crisis here are some of the points that I emphasize uh, getting back to the issue of pro bono commitment even though I recognize this is controversial and there are a lot of reasons why people should not be required to do something which should fall within our voluntary spirit I think the crisis we face the access to justice crisis we face 
is so serious that there should be a mandatory pro bono requirement for all lawyers as a condition for our being in a profession and i think if we do take the fifty aspirational hours one of the figures i point out is not only would we have four million hours of pro bono time in the district of columbia we would have sixty million nationally uh... now i recognize that in and of itself would create a problem because how you supervise uh, this massive number of lawyers who would be suddenly providing pro bono service. But I think that's a challenge that we can resolve. Secondly, I think there has to be a major push to have lawyers at all levels offer greatly reduced fees and limited scope uh, opportunities for lawyers to pro provide partial service to those who are not impoverished but had limited means. An example I gave in the book is why don't big law firms create affiliates which will charge far lower fees for a different population? If we are only representing 20 percent or maybe even less than that of the population in this country, why can't we creatively come up with lower fee structures, uh, particularly at a time when the job market is so bad? And big law firms are, in effect, reducing the numbers of young lawyers they hire. Uh, so there's this big population that I think we can reach if we do something about our fee structure. Third point, we really do need to eliminate the monopoly that precludes non-lawyers from helping lawyers address legal services needs. I mean, not only do we have a massive number of senior lawyers who are at a stage now, and we really have to figure out how to tap into that, but we have a lot of corporate executives and others who feel that they want to help. Uh, the state of Washington has now established a program where they certify and train non-lawyers to help solve legal problems working in conjunction with the legal profession. We have to do the same. And again, I want to emphasize, we have to figure out creative ways of tapping into this massive senior lawyer population to address some of the access to justice crisis problems we have. So those are some of the things I talk about with respect to access to justice. Now, what about the culture of law firms? Uh, the points I make there, which I want to just very briefly touch upon, uh, are that, first of all, uh, having now had some experience in big law firms, uh, I now know why associates in law firms who were recently surveyed dislike their jobs more than customer service representatives <laughs> working in department stores who were also surveyed. And why is that? Uh, in effect, the, the, the thing that I point out, and this was based upon a lot of interviewing I did with associates, is they feel like nothing more than cogs in a wheel. Uh, their professional development opportunities are limited. Uh, some of us who went into law firms a long time ago knew that if you got into a law firm, it meant within five or six or seven years you would be a partner and there was a focus on helping you to succeed. Uh, now, one out of every ten associates that comes into a law firm may make that level. Others will not, and they will fall by the wayside. Uh, we need to create a much better culture in law firms, and I think, frankly, this is in a law firm's self-interest to promote professional development, to encourage and utilize the talent that they have, or the model of law firm that we now have today is not going to succeed. Uh, the other point I make is, and <coughs> I recognize aspirations are somehow very difficult to achieve, but I, in looking at ethics rules, I have not seen reference to the fact that a profession like ours should not focus simply on self-interest is the primary purpose for being. We ought to be guided by the principle even more emphatically that our duty to clients and public service is more important than self-interest. We've just lost that along the way.
And the final uh, set of recommendations I just want to touch upon very briefly are the amazing fact, and there are some of us who are academics, that for the most part, professional schools for the legal profession focus on teaching doctrine and law, but do not serve as laboratories examining ways that we can improve service in more cost-effective <coughs> ways, testing out new ideas, and also providing, whether it's through websites or in other ways, information for the public about the legal system in ways that the medical profession does uh, to encourage preventive care. Law schools in general, and uh, there are certainly some exceptions, and Georgetown is doing some very exciting things at the moment, but law firms, excuse me, law schools are isolated from the legal profession and from providing service to the public, and that has to change. So those are some of the points uh, that I stress in my book. Uh, and I want to make one uh, observation. Actually, the observation comes from my wife, Lori Robinson. She said, if you're going to write a book about the problems in the legal profession, it will be encyclop encyclopedic in socks. <laughs> and why do we have a book uh, that doesn't fall within that definition at all? And here's why. Uh, in my law school classes, uh, I try to stress for the next generation of lawyers the importance of being concise, uh, writing in a very uh, readable fashion, uh, because the notion that lawyers love to charge by the word uh, <laughs> so that they can make as much as possible uh, you know, is a problem. Uh, and I think uh, for those of us who've been in court uh, on many occasions, we've even found that judges are getting very tired of reading long, unnecessarily the uh, obtuse uh, memoranda. So I decided to write a book that followed those standards, something that's concise, hopefully readable, and that has an agenda uh, that I hope will stimulate uh, some action. Now, let me close with uh, a quote that I found from Justice Harlan Stone. He said this in 1934, 80 years ago and it's still so pertinent today. He said, steadily the best skill and capacity of the legal profession has been drawn into the service of business and finance. More and more, the amount of his income is the measure of professional success, rather than the intangible and durable satisfactions which are to be found in a professional service more consciously directed toward the advancement of the public interest. What a shame that we have not followed uh, those views, and it's time for us to change. Uh, the final comment I wanted to make is that because I think very much of the future depends <coughs> on the ability of the next generation of lawyers to pursue public interest, uh, I'm going to donate any royalties that I get to support fellowships that allow law students to work for public interest organizations because that's going to be critically important going forward. So those are my preliminary remarks uh, and I welcome any challenging question uh, and I hope that there will be some. <laughs> okay. And uh, my dentist is back. He was getting ready to applaud. You can applaud. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, over here. Yes. Okay, so I'm one of those disillusioned lawyers that you talked about. Um, I went to Yale Law School in the early 70s. We studied the Warren Court. It was marvelous. And I hated law practice. I worked for Mayor Brown for a while, for the federal government for a long time. Excuse me. <coughs> and I got so disillusioned. At 40, I went to medical school and became a physician. And now I work with a law firm, Grant and Eisenhofer, that brings key TAM cases for Medicare and Medicaid fraud. Um, lots of questions, but here are two. Um, you haven't mentioned the fact that something, I don't know, 20, 30% of current law graduates can't get jobs, and that 
and lots of the ones who are employed are not employed as lawyers, they're employed as something else. Um, so how do you fit them in? And second of all, in the, I don't remember exactly when, maybe it was the 70s or the 80s, uh, there was an attempt to set up sort of corporations of lawyers for normal people, um, uh, sort of along the line of a clinic. I don't remember who did it. He was one of these entrepreneurial types, but the idea was that you, they would get achieve economies of scale, um, and you would have lots of lawyers getting paid reasonable middle-class type wages who would service a lot of uh, ordinary people. Um, and that doesn't seem, maybe it's around, but I haven't seen it in, I haven't seen it in decades. So what do you do with all the unemployed lawyers, unemployable lawyers, and why, does it, why didn't this model catch on? All right, uh, what's your name? Carolyn Poplin, P -O -P. Carolyn? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, well, Carolyn, uh, you obviously asked some very important questions. Let me give you some additional statistics that okay. uh, go with the comment you made. Uh, we have reached a point where, uh, even though the the, sti you know, the the statistics look fairly good for people going to law school, because well over 80 percent end up with jobs, but the question of what kinds of jobs those uh, tend to be. And uh, as you point out, uh, a lot of them are not with law firms. Uh, we have reached a point now where 50 percent of graduates of law schools do not go into private practice because of the limited job market. And a lot of the remaining number go into jobs where they are, it's not necessary that they be licensed. Uh, so I think those statistics support the view that if we are not serving 80 percent of the population who have legal problems, uh, that we ought to begin to focus our attention on how to change our models so that people who, by the way, if they do have the same idealism that many of us did, which that they would like to be in a helping profession and not worry so much about income levels, there are, there's a potential job market out there. And let me just mention another statistic which is that a very high percent of lawyers in this country live in six states in the District of Columbia clustered in urban areas where there are businesses right. that you can represent. There is the rest of the country, uh, including Nebraska where I grew up, where there are relatively few lawyers, uh, and particularly in rural areas uh, throughout the country, which raises the issue uh, of kind of reestablishing the notion of community lawyers who go to communities and become really important in their respective uh, areas. There is some movement to provide some financial support uh, for lawyers to move into those areas in the same way that it's being done for medical personnel. Uh, and so that's really uh, another opportunity. Uh, I think with respect to uh, the models you talked about uh, and with the development of, uh, of technology, uh, there are going to be a whole variety of new ways to serve clients learning from the mistakes that we've made up to this point, which is why I think this is a pivotal moment in history. Uh, I would really like the challenge of graduating from a law school today thinking that, well, it may not be possible to go into these really big law firms because they're cutting back and uh, relying primarily on hiring laterals as opposed to young associates. But look at all the other opportunities out there. Uh, and I, I think that uh, the issue, though, of student law student debt is a serious one. If you graduate law school and you're $150,000 in debt, and you normally wanted to gravitate to a big firm if you could, what do you do? Well, there is some movement, uh, and I think a lot of you are aware of this, which really has to grow substantially, and that is there have to be financial incentives for people with debt to work in public interest in a way that does not strangle them financially. Uh, Georgetown, again, has a number of programs which provide public interest fellowships, their loan repayment programs. We have to generate tremendous support uh, to take on this student debt program so that it does not preclude people from doing the things that they should be doing. 
Uh, next question. Yes. <coughs> yes. <coughs> My name <coughs> is Jules Bernstein. I have been practicing worker and union side labor law here since 1960, and I will have to say, well, still going strong at it. Uh, let me say that with the decline of unions, one of the things that has happened is the development of 200 or more worker centers across the country, uh, started by community and religious organizations to deal with the unmet legal needs of working people, for the most part low-wage workers, uh, and this is spreading uh, very substantially across the country. So that's one kind of development. <coughs> Secondly, uh, about 25 years ago, small solo practitioners in the employment field, representing uh, people on job-related matters, formed something called the National Employment Lawyers Association. With today, with about 3,000 members, they'll have a convention in Boston. I'm a member, I have to say. Uh, have a convention in Boston around the end of June. Then, uh, to answer this lady's question, some will recall the people whose memories are still with them. Uh, uh, Jacoby and Myers was that law firm that established, I think you mentioned Jacoby and Myers in here someplace. Yes, I do. A law firm <coughs> established uh, for moderate income people. One of the issues I think you mentioned in the book is that Jacoby and Myers was trying to get funding from non legal sources. And uh, that uh, they got a battle from the bar about. Uh, which I don't know what the outcome was. That was one of the questions I was going to ask you. Last, and this comes down to a question, really. So what are you going to do about, uh, and what have you done about establishing the American Legal Profession Institute at page 132? Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I think you're pretty far from retirement, given uh, your enthusiasm. Uh, and uh, I, I like some of the things you commented about with respect to uh, providing uh, services uh, in the employment area. And I just wanted to uh, comment about one other thing related to that, which is the notion of prepaid legal insurance. Uh, which was an idea that uh, developed many years ago uh, and somehow has lost its way. And I think to support the kinds of things you're talking about, uh, to see what can be done to reestablish prepaid legal insurance as an option, not only for union workers but for a whole variety of other people, uh, and have uh, law, law firms in uh, basically buy into the notion that we will be glad to have prepaid legal insurance. Uh, we will limit our rates to $50 an hour, $25 an hour, uh, would, would be very uh, mm -hmm. important. Now, you made a reference to uh, the fact that I recommend the creation of a national institute focusing on the legal profession. Uh, because there is something called the American Law Institute, which focuses on improving law, but there's nothing uh, analogous to that for improving our legal profession. So I suggested that there be something created at the national level uh, and that the focus be one that would include consumers of legal services along with lawyers to really identify important ways to reform the profession. I think it's an important concept. Uh, I don't know whether the, if the American Bar Association or the establishment organizations are going to support it, but we need research and development and laboratories to test out new ways of providing better service in a more cost-effective way for our clients. And the last question you raised, which is non-lawyer investment in law firms or legal services. Uh, the American Bar Association uh, rejected it in its most recent review of uh, you know, ethics. Uh, my own view, 
and there are some experimental work now being done in other countries the united kingdom now allows non lawyer investment if we're not going to tackle the problem of access to justice on our own we're not going to reach out to these populations then uh, i think if walmart uh, wants to come in and provide that kind of service uh, or if there are other creative entrepreneurs who want to invest in new models of legal services uh, I don't think we ought to resist it uh, because the problem is just too big and the notion that uh, somehow uh, non-lawyer investment in what we do is uh, is going to taint uh, the quality of our profession I just I'm not sure it holds up uh, you're gonna have to, yes Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks for writing uh, this book. I think it's really important and it's great to have these conversations. Um, one, I've always been a public interest lawyer. Um, and one of the things that uh, we see when you go to a conferences like Equal Justice Works has a conference where they bring together all these law students who want to do public interest work is there's many, many, many more law students and gr law graduates who would like to do public interest work than there are jobs for them. So, uh, and, you know, all the groups that do this work scramble all the time, you know, for funds so that they can uh, do the wonderful things that Jules talked about and others, you know, all, there's many, many public interest organizations. So um, there's, there's like two legal worlds. There's the, you know, the one we read about in the New Yorker, I, that you, you know, the Dewey LaBeouf uh, implosion where lawyers are getting signing bonuses of $8 million. And then there's um, the other legal, prof the other side of the, the legal profession, at least from where I sit, where there, you have a lot of demand to do good work, but there aren't the jobs for these young people to do them. So I, I think it would be, um, I, mean, I haven't read your book, it, th that's another uh, element I think we, we, we need to think about is how do we um, create the organizations or expand the organizations that exist so that we can have jobs for all these young people who want to do the good work and don't want to make you know millions of dollars. That's not, that's not what they became lawyers for. Uh, well, your observation is exactly right. Uh, and for those of us who teach in law schools and take the temperature of the students, we have a very substantial percent of them would like to do public interest kind of work. Uh, the problem for them is the job market does not support it. Uh, and I think it's a shame in a way the Ford Foundation uh, in the 60s provided major financial support uh, to encourage public interest development. And it's now missing in action. All the major foundations yeah, yeah. are, are missing in action. Uh, one, the Public Welfare Foundation, uh, which actually Peter chaired for uh, a number of years, is kind of out in the wilderness on its own trying to promote the idea that we need major private funding to help support a, a renewal uh, in the public uh, interest field. Uh, as I mentioned before, I mean, one thing deals with how we can provide financial support through fellowships and other ways. Uh, I think the nonprofit sector would love to have more people join it, but you're right, they're struggling with their own budgets at the moment. Uh, the other factor, though, that's significant that I, I guess is not well known is there is an assumption within the public, and uh, I talk about it in the book, the lawyers make a lot of money. Uh, and obviously, if you take a look at a DLA Piper salary for an entering associate, uh, that may be the case. But take a look at the averages. The average salary for a lawyer in society today is, you know, in the fifty, sixty thousand dollar range. Mm -hmm. uh, public interest now pays, you know, maybe thirty five, forty thousand. Uh, so in fact, I think frankly, students, a lot of students are schooled to the notion that they're not gonna make uh, what big firms make. So they're re ready to adjust their sites if the job market is there and there's a way to pay off their loans. So that's the challenge for us. John Grisham uh, wrote a, a fantastic book, which some of the people here may have read. It's The Litigators, in which uh, somebody from a prestigious law firm joins, a, uh, essentially has lots of money from billable hours, but no life and goes nuts. 
But in any event, uh, your background from Nebraska, which is middle America at temperatures that are far worse than what Washington has experienced, <laughs> to Boston, which is can be crazy, to San Diego, which can be the opposite scheme, crazy. Um, for practical purposes, though, um, what have you, besides giving donations to, from whatever you're selling as your book or your profits from your book that your publisher allows, what have you personally done to set up community clinics for persons who need legal aid? Uh, the problem is frivolous lawsuits, judges who don't deny those uh, frivolous lawsuits, and then persons who are left in the lurch. Uh, first of all, I'm impressed that you've followed my movement around the country, uh, uh, and you're right about weather. I listened. In, you're right about weather in Nebraska. Uh, but uh, what uh, uh, I have done uh, probably the, the last few years before going back into academic life uh, was creating a, uh, an affiliate to a law firm to work on rule of law, pro bono initiatives outside the United States. Uh, and I think uh, that was an important uh, thing for uh, lawyers to do. Uh, there are countries around the world in developing post-conflict uh, situations where they have very few lawyers in critical needs. Uh, but my view right now is the model of creating affiliates uh, should return its focus domestically. Uh, I'm not opposed to working outside the United States. There are things that need to be done there. Uh, but for us, for those of us who care about these issues, uh, we ought to look closer to home. And your example of uh, promoting the idea of uh, uh, getting law firms back to creating clinics is, is one illustration, uh, is important. There is a movement right now uh, within some law schools uh, and some communities uh, to create models which will allow recent graduates uh, to in effect stay affiliated with their law schools in some way, uh, get some compensation and training, get referrals uh, for lower level, lower income uh, work in return for their willingness to provide pro bono. Uh, there are all kinds of models that we ought to be testing, including the one you, you've mentioned. And frankly, to the extent that uh, I can join a community of lawyers now who are willing to invest the next few years in thinking about what these models ought to be and testing them out, uh, I think that's a worthwhile undertaking. Me? Okay. I'm Bob Lubick, and I'm a former former colleague of Shelton's. I've also been a practicing lawyer. And then I started something new, and I found it was ahead of its time. Something, a large part of the cost of the using a lawyer is litigation. We all know that. It is beyond reach, and also any type of dispute resolution. I tried to put forward something called mediation, which has been along since the caveman, where you don't need a lawyer, you need someone to help two people come to a resolution. I haven't read your book. I will read it. But if you have mentioned it already, I'll get off the stand. Otherwise, what I'd like to see is mediation of any dispute. It doesn't have to be a lawyer to mediate. Someone, it doesn't have to be court driven. It can come before. But what do you think of having some type of a mediation to satisfy a dispute, which is a large portion of the cost of using lawyers? Uh, clearly important, Bob, uh, and uh, I think there needs to be a lot of support in that area. A lot of my focus, however, uh, relate to different kinds of issues than that. I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, depreciating the value of doing uh, something that focuses on alternatives to litigation. But there are so many things that exist in a community like Washington where uh, people need advice ranging from uh, how to handle being uh, sued uh, because of a consumer protection related issue or dealing with a child custody problem or struggling with being homeless and you know being in in, uh, in housing court 
uh, the day-to-day -day problems that uh, so many Americans have where they have nowhere to turn. So it's not, again, it's not saying litigation-related issues are not important, uh, but people need all kinds of advice uh, that even talk about, you know, how to draft uh, uh, simple agreements and things like that. So my only view is that, that we need to not only deal with your issue, but look more broadly at the legal problems that people have on a day-to-day -day basis and try to respond to them. Thank you. Hello, uh, Edgar Kahn. Uh, I'm co-founder with my wife of the Antioch School of Law and the UDC School of Law is its successor. We're looking at, but I can't find law schools that are even teaching young lawyers how to set up practices. Uh, most law professors don't know anything about law as a business. <coughs> uh, and, um, and I think, but I think on the other hand, they do have expertise that the kind of subsidiaries that you're talking about uh, could benefit from in landlord tenant and in uniform commercial code and other issues where there is expertise required and many of the lawyers whom I've met who are out there feel that they're not equipped to deal with the groups and the problems so they feel unprepared even though they're practicing lawyers. So I'm wondering whether there are partnerships that you see between law schools and law firms because l law schools are afraid to get into the money making uh, to set up something that could actually make money and uh, and and law firms may be uh, hesitant to get into the pro bono business. Well, uh, first of all, for those of you who do not know Edgar Kahn, he is a legendary figure and uh, I think we need you to get back in the business of creating uh, a new model of law school. <laughs> uh, which focuses on the kind of issues uh, you're talking about. The, the problem is there is a schism between the profession and the academic world. Uh, and most academics who are uh, brilliant uh, and engage in scholarship uh, that may be important in an academic setting have little to do with what's going on in the profession. Uh, and the idea of developing a better marriage, which will allow practitioners to spend more time in the academic setting, uh, bringing some realistic assessment uh, for students about uh, you know, what to do in, uh, once they graduate, is an important idea. Uh, and uh, little by little, I think it, it, it may happen. Uh, the ABA accreditation process for law schools is starting very slightly uh, <laughs> to be modified. But I would say that as of right now, Edgar, uh, we need more of you uh, carrying your message into more law schools because uh, students who are being educated today leave, a lot of them leave, without any idea about the profession itself. And it's a real shame. Well, it would be important to set up uh, even an informal group to develop incubators for those new kinds of institutions. Right, and and again, there there is some movement afoot, uh, and there, are, uh, and actually, I for those of you who did not see it recently, uh, uh, Chief Judge uh, Jonathan Lipman in New York uh, has just uh, refined the New York rules to allow students. Uh, to take a bar exam early if their last six months in school are committed to pro bono uh, activity. Uh, California is now taking a hard look at changing its requirements. So there may be, and I, I had mentioned before the notion this may be a pivotal time in history, there is some movement in a lot of different directions which suggest if we take the initiative as a profession, we can do what people have talked about and have not accomplished for years, which is change our direction. Excuse me, Sheldon. Yes. One here and one here and then we'll close. Sheldon, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I do, when I heard your response to the question about mediation, that advice and, and helping people through, uh, who don't have access to a lawyer, through difficult decisions related to law, it occurs to me that there is probably a very good informational uh, function that people who are trained as lawyers can perform in taking what is quite an opaque priesthood um, and 
translating what it what it uh, would advise people to do in a way that individuals and perhaps people who are paralegals not trained in the law could then uh, turn and use. And just as the, you pointed out, the medical profession has boiled down a lot of basic information. There seems to be no reason why the legal profession couldn't do the same thing and update that and make it available over the internet and in community centers. And I would think that um, uh, foundations that may be squeamish about funding litigation these days would find that quite compelling. And I would think that grant making for that, that sort of function would go a long way toward uh, at least providing tools that that um, uh, uh, a range of people could use to improve legal service delivery or legal advice delivery to poor people. And I'm curious if that's been tried. I, I see this in the high-end part of the legal profession where big uh, law firms, I think, are increasingly facing competition from entities that are not they're not lawyers, but they sell essentially information services in lieu of legal advice. And they yeah. crop up in all sorts of different areas and are competing uh, it very aggressively without the state bars being able to stop them. And it seems to me that there's no reason why there couldn't be a set of tools available um, w with grant making that would then get more and more people interested in then funding people to, at, a, at this, these sorts of affordable rates, provide really useful advice. I'm curious if there have been any efforts in that, that yeah. domain. Well, well first of all, Jim, uh, I, I think you're quite right about the importance of this area. There is a substantial uh, movement to support uh, self-help. Uh, there are a lot of self-help organizations out there. Uh, which basically try to teach people uh, how to protect their rights. Uh, and I gave the example of LegalZoom, which is uh, a new competitor out there. Uh, and the notion is that, you know, th these are, in effect, non-lawyers who s see a marketplace to provide information and help to people who are representing their own interests. Uh, I, think the, I think you're right that this is a way to uh, 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 for foundations to provide some help in this area. Uh, and I have no doubt in the next four or five or six years uh, there will be major developments here. A uh, Washington State example that I gave where, in effect, people are trained and certified in what they can do uh, either on their own or in conjunction with lawyers is provide basic information uh, on what the legal requirements are, how you gather necessary documents, mm -hmm. how you put together simple uh, petitions, how you draft wills. Uh, and you know, if you take a look at the kinds of problems that people have, there are various <laughs> levels of sophistication. And a lot of the problems that people have that are, they deeply care about and need help on, uh, with some you know, sig uh, insignificant training, I would say, you can really reach that market and provide that service. I also agree that uh, that there is a potential of developing apps uh, which can go on smartphones, which can be helpful to people. I mean, the, the striking thing to me about spending time in uh, Southern Africa, where people don't have computers, but everybody's got a telephone. You know, they all have cell phones, they, you know, they, and they're certainly moving in smartphones, and they need help and they live in areas where there are no lawyers. Uh, you know, the potential uh, using simple technology of providing basic information about our legal system and how to address certain kinds of problems is very significant. And I think, uh, I, I think the next decade we will see some major movement there. Good. Thank okay. you. <coughs> Hi, Shelley. Hello, um, Shelley. <laughs> the other Shelley. Um, <coughs> I, uh, I succeeded Edgar as dean at the UDC, David A. Clark School of Law. He w I was his last hire at Antioch. Uh. Um, <clears throat> so we've been shoulder to shoulder for a long time. And I just, you know, I think there's room, I, I, I want to make two points. I think there's room for different models of law schools. And our law school is, you know, the, the opposite of the average generic law school. We start, Edgar teaches the very first course, students come in. And they take law and social justice two weeks before classes even begin, 
and they meet lawyers for the homeless and they go do 40 hours of community <coughs> service in their first year. They, we then fund by raising money from people in this room and others summer public interest fellowships to help folks get in the door and work for free for someplace else. We have eight pathways to the profession so that you, every student is required to do two seven credit clinics so that you graduate having spent 10000 a year or 20000 a year for tuition instead of 50. 26 schools now have over 50000 in tuition. So you get out without a lot of debt and you've learned how to practice law. So what th one, th that's one point. There is a model where you don't have to spend a bazillion dollars and get out in debt for the rest of your life. Uh, it took me 20 years to pay off my law school debt. I'm still bitter. Uh, <laughs> Edgar hired me as the lowest paid law <laughs> professor in America, which is also. But anyway, the, the other point is, I think one of the dynamics we haven't talked about that is really happening in legal education now, I mean in, uh, in law practice, is low bono. So we have a huge dynamic of graduates of Georgetown and every other school in town, including ours, of people going into private practice, setting up their own shops very small firms or even solo practice, where they're kind of doing like a family practice <coughs> doctor used to do, and charging affordable rates, low bono kinds of rates, uh, for people to do some of the basic things that people couldn't afford to hire lawyers to do before. Um, and I think that that is something that really should be encouraged in part with these incubator programs, but with folks going to schools like ours where you don't have a massive amount of debt and you don't have to charge that much to be able to live. So I think there are some exciting models. I look forward to uh, working with you on the Access to Justice Commission and trying to make it happen. So yeah. you join us, everybody. <laughs> right. uh, well, Shelley, you're absolutely right that there uh, should not be just one model of a law school. Uh, un unfortunately, most law schools feel they have to look like Harvard and Yale and University of Chicago. Uh, but law schools should be different, like yours is, uh, you know, doing very innovative uh, kinds of things. And uh, I mean, you've underscored another point, which are some recent developments uh, in this community, uh, which again is a suggestion that rather than sit back and just grouse about what the problems are, it is time for us to be uh, inventive. Uh, our big challenge is going to be to push the big legal profession bureaucracies. Uh, uh, if you ever tried to work your way through, as an illustration, uh, the ABA process, and uh, again, my wife, Lori Robinson, worked with the ABA for a number of years, the notion of adjusting, making changes in ethics rules to permit a lot of the things we're talking about uh, is just a daunting, endless task. Uh, and so my bottom line is uh, we need to take initiative now. We need to promote experimentation now. Uh, uh, I would love the fact that law schools and maybe even some of the big law firms would take some initiative and, and say, let's be creative. Uh, we have to, again, become a broad-based helping profession. Uh, and I'm not opposed to making money, but it cannot be the sole reason why somebody should go into the legal profession. So thank you all. Thank you.